Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to Simply Learn's webinar on innovation in the digital era. Today we're honored to have uh, not just one but two guests. Uh, both of them we could easily do their own webinar on. Um, my name is Richard. I'll be mostly in the background helping out, um, making sure everything is running smoothly and uh, making sure things switch over. We also have another team in the back, so you might hear for some other people. Uh, if you haven't met um, our two guests or you're not familiar with them, we have Avnish Sabarwal. Hopefully I said the name correctly. Uh, he's Managing Director of in uh, Accenture India Corporate Strategy, Ventures, and Open Innovation. <laughs> 25 years developing, growing, and turning around businesses for the top 500 Fortune clients, mature and emerging markets. He served in the Indian Armed Forces and has a performed the role of aide-de-camp of the Governor of MP. Uh, following, following that, we'll have Dr. Samduta Singh, Indian serial entrepreneur, angel investor, NASCOM 10K, Microsoft and Target Accelerator mentor, currently co-chair NASCOM Product Council, advisor to the Karnataka, I hope I said that right, ITBT Ministry and the DIPP Government of India. Co-trustee and director of Center for Entrepreneurial Excellence, CEE, while also bearing the founder and director of Unspun Group, one of India's first technology-driven marketing companies based out of Bangalore. Uh, Bangalore. Um, she's an expert in product-to-market fit assessment, customer segmentation, competitor's advantage, mapping, pricing, and lead generation, an MBA degree and PhD in management, tutors at prestigious institutions, institutions in India like IFIM, Institute of Finance and International Management, and IIITB, International Institute of Information Technology, Bangalore. She strives to build a dedicated discipline curriculum on entrepreneurship and build the e-cell that will mentor entrepreneurs from scratch, from setting up shop to getting them out in the market. She's also a board member of the IT Software Policymaking Department of IT and Electronics. Uh, both of these people bring a lot of experience, so if you're here for the digital era, I'm excited to hear what they have to say and uh, join them in their setup. Before we get started, let's go ahead and introduce you to your webinar setup. You'll notice on the uh, upper right-hand corner, if it's collapsed, there might be a red arrow you have to click on to expand it, and you'll see a chat box. If you can go ahead, and I see some people who have already been in there chatting, just go ahead and chat hello. Uh, let both of our honored guests know that you're here and you're excited to see them. And this also does a real quick sound check. I know I did one earlier, but we'll do one again. Just go ahead and type hello. Oh, great. Thank you. Great to have you, Nalin. Uh, there we go. Avnish Anurag. Hopefully I'm getting the names correctly. Uh, excited to have everybody here. Uh, you didn't come here to talk, to uh, listen to me speak. So we're going to go ahead and pass this over. Um, Give us just a moment here to make sure we have our first guest speaker, Avnish, online. And set him up with, oh, hold on, I need to get my, um, <laughs> I need to go ahead and have the people in the back because this is set up across three different computers. And for those people who don't have an Indian dial-in number, we'll have to take a look at that in just a moment if you're having trouble connecting. Um, so go ahead and sit back. Uh, if you evening where you're at, maybe a glass of wine, or if it's early morning like I am, a cup of coffee or tea, and give us just a moment to get the uh, rights passed over and the sound set up correctly so we can get our first guest speaker up and running. There we go. All right, thanks, Avnish. Um, here we go. I'm going to let you take it away, and let's jump right in there. Uh, a little late, but we're going. All right. So, uh Thanks everybody for joining. This is Avnish, and uh, apologies for whatever happened. I also have no idea of uh, what was going on. But hopefully we can still uh, remain in time. I'll try and go through my piece uh, pretty quickly and uh, then hand over to Dr. Shom. And hopefully after that we have a few minutes for Q&A as well. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is the agenda. I don't want to delve into that. Uh, Tina, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, let's look into the digital disruption. So I wanted to start here in terms of where we are. You know, I think you've all heard about the fourth revolution and the second machine age. So the first industrial revolution which happened used water and steam power to mechanize production. The second used electric power to create mass production. The third used electronics and information technology to automate production. 
And what we now see is a fourth industrial revolution, which is building up on the third one. And the digital revolution that has been occurring <coughs> since actually middle of the last century, it is characterized by a fusion of technology that is blurring the line between physical, di digital, and biological spheres. Right. And there are three reasons why today's transformation represents not merely an extension of the third industrial revolution, but rather what I call the arrival of the fourth and distinct one. And these three are velocity, scope, and systems impact. Just to explain what I mean, the speed of current breakthroughs has no historical precedent, what we are seeing now. When compared with the previous industrial revolutions, the fourth is evolving at an exponential rather than a linear pace. And this is a big difference between the other three and what is happening now. Moreover, it is uh, disrupting almost every industry in every country, and the breadth and depth of these changes basically held the transformation of entire systems of production, management, and governance. So this is what the fourth revolution is, or fourth industrial revolution. A lot of it is being characterized by what you see on the top left, Industry 4.0. Uh, industry 4.0 or Industrial Internet or uh, IIoT, whatever you may call it, is a big part of what is defining the industrial uh, fourth industrial revolution. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so what you see here is that, you know, you see all the different uh, S-curves in terms of the technology which have disrupted uh, uh, our, uh, our society and work, right from the mainframe to client servers and, uh, you know, web, when you had the smack set of technology. Uh, what is different at this point of time is that uh, you know, all these possibilities will be multiplied by an emerging technology uh, breakthroughs in fields such as artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, uh, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology, all these, right? And the most interesting part here is that while we tend to talk a lot about these technologies independently and what is the impact of these technologies, the more important thing is how they are combining together, right? So the combinatorial effect in terms of how they combine together and the exponential value creation which happens and also the exponential disruption which happens is because of this particular thing that you know these technologies are combining together rather than acting independently. Can I go to the next slide please? Yeah. So this is just another elaborate uh, you know, we, uh, a depiction of what I was talking about earlier, if, and if you could look at some of these technologies like deep learning, right? It could, that could be worth 35 Amazons in 20 years, and that's saying a lot. Uh, we all understand what Amazon is. Now, you look at robotics and automation is expected to liberate. Uh, I find that word very interesting because uh, that is the biggest uh, fear which people have, and I think it's very intrinsic to the discussion which we are having today. That if robotics and automation is going to liberate 13 trillion by 2035, what it basically says is that a lot of jobs uh, will get liberated. And uh, and that's something which we will discuss as we go ahead. And then you see similar things in terms of global 3D printing, expected to be a huge market, um, mobile transactions, autonomous taxis to overtake automakers. I think auto automotive industry is at a cusp of huge disruption. There are three big things happening there, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and mobility as a service. And then obviously blockchain and crypto assets, which uh, is still a question mark in my view. People are still trying to figure out what it is. And, uh, you know, when you look into cryptocurrency and you look at Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, you know, they have spectacular dives and, uh, and, and rises. And uh, that, is, that is exciting a lot of people. But uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the final or the real value of blockchain will come in, not in the, the Bitcoin bit or the financial services where we tend to associate them with. It's going to come in associated thing. For example, how blockchain is going to increase the trust factor in the inter uh, in the uh, in the Internet of Things, uh, IoT. How uh, you know blockchain is going to be used in supply chain. How it's going to be used in logistics. Those things will be and those use cases will be much more powerful as we go ahead. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And when you look into that, you know, all these things are happening and uh, what is the impact? So if you people think that, uh, well, you know, what is the evidence? So this shows you the evidence, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, basically this study says that 50% of the S&P 500 will be replaced by 2025. And that's a significant number. And the average lifespan on S&P 500 index uh, has significantly reduced and it's going to be 
reducing for, uh, further, almost going to about 14 years by 2026. So a lifespan of a company which earlier used to be for hundreds of years is now just going to be 14 years. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, real examples of uh, the big companies which have entered uh, the, the S&P list and which have exited. So no surprises in terms of who have, who have uh, entered Amazon, Google, uh, Netflix, Facebook. And you can see all of them that the one key characteristic which, uh, which defines all of them is these are all platform companies, right? And what you see on the right-hand side are all what I call the value chain companies. And this is a key, uh, key insight from this session for all of you that when a platform company competes or whenever a platform competes, uh, com company competes with a value chain company, the, the platform company always wins. And that is what is happening. And that is why even the legacy organizations are trying to become platform organizations in their own way. But this is a good example of the company which have got replaced and which have entered this list. And more and more, we will see platform companies dominating this list. Can we go to the next slide, please? OK, so this adds a little bit of humor as well in terms of so when, when all this is happening, so where is the disruption uh, going to come from? And if you look at the organizations, you know, big organizations, whether it's Accenture or Microsoft or, or IBM or even industrial organizations, uh, like Honeywell or GE, uh, they are very well understanding that uh, you know the competition, the face of competition is significantly changing. If you had asked us in terms of what our competition was and and the you know the answer which we gave you is very very different to what it is now. And the reason for that would be explained in the in the next slide. If we can go to that. Uh, the when we talk about disruptive innovation, right? Disruptive innovation is never going to come from a legacy incumbent. So, for example, if it's Honeywell. Honeywell is not going to get disrupted by GE or Siemens or Bosch. Uh, it is going to get disrupted by companies like, for example, Nest, which was bought by Google uh, in the home automation space. And similarly, if you look at all the businesses of Honeywell, they are all getting disrupted by very small, agile, digital disruptive startups, which initially operate under the radar, and they are not really attacking your most profitable customer segment. Uh, but slowly, slowly, they encroach onto that, and by the time you realize, uh, it's generally too late, and the bullet is already out of the gun. So the key message here is that when we talk about disruption, uh, which we were looking into a previous slide, it's not going to happen from big organizations, incumbents, and legacy organizations. It's going to come from digital startups. Okay. What do digital enterprises do in terms of how do how do they survive the disruption? So one, you need to, for example, uh, you know, when we talk to our clients in terms of their own digital transformation strategy, the first is that you need to make sure that they are defending uh, their uh, their field. So you have to defend, and then you need to become a disruptor on your own right. And you can do that through some of these things which you look into here. Uh, you know, coming into digital business models, a lot of organizations are using digital technologies not just to improve operational efficiency or to improve customer experience, but uh, the big organizations uh, which are into digital are looking into how do they come up with a complete new uh, business model. And, uh, and that's probably the most interesting thing. You look at some of the other ones as well, like digital operating models and digital matrix. Uh, these are important. But what we are talking about today is the digital talent and skills. So. Uh, Talent was always important, but now it has become critically important in the digital era. And uh, the only difference is that uh, you know success will be very unevenly distributed in terms of the people who get um, uh, you know jobs and who don't get jobs. And I think that's the fundamental thing, and that also requires that uh, you know we need to be constant learners as we go ahead. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So can we just go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so uh, that's the digital disruption. And now, uh, in terms of what Accenture's own experience is from the workforce of the future, I'll quickly touch upon that. Uh, you can see here uh, plenty of negative press has been going around, uh, whether it is in India or outside, in terms of what uh, you know, what the technology, especially artificial intelligence and automation, is going to do in terms of uh, jobs. So you can you can see some of these headlines. And uh, there have been McKinsey reports and other reports as well, which say that almost you know 60 to 70 percent of the current jobs uh, in India, for example, will get disrupted or will not exist the way they do. And that uh, definitely has implications in terms of what kind of skills uh, our education institutes are imparting 
Um, and, you know, this is going to be very relevant when I hand over to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Shom. She's going to talk about that more. Uh, so I will not talk about it now in great depth. But the key thing is that if you want to, uh, you know, let's say survive or thrive in this particular age, one, you need to be a, a lifelong learner. And secondly, you know, our education institutes need to change as well in terms of what kind of skills they are teaching because, uh, I think we are all aware that it takes hell of a lot of time for these education institutes to change. Uh, these are monolithic organizations which have been teaching the same curricula for, you know, for years. But if they don't change very fast now, uh, I think that's going to be a big disservice uh, to our workers and to our employees because I can feel that a lot of people, for example, who are doing software engineering and, you know, just very generic coding, when they come out after three, four years uh, from the college, uh, at one point of time, they were spoiled for choice. Uh, many organizations would go them. That's not going to happen now. So unless you are able to complement that with some additional skills, uh, which are very unique, uh, this will be a very tough thing uh, going forward. Okay. Now, uh, again, just we wanted to do some, you know, sense check in terms of all this, uh, while all this, uh, you know, gloom and doom is going to be or is being predicted, what ex actually is happening. And this is a global employment outlook for the ICT industry. We looked into ICT and professional services, which I'll look into the next slide. But what you say is that things are not that bad, right? So if you look at it in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the job families on the left-hand side, there's a significant growth happening. You know, it's 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 growing there. Sales and related things are growing. So things are generally okay. And if you, if you look at on the top right-hand side, you will see from a workforce disruption perspective, uh, it's generally stable. So the employment outlook is stable at this point of time. And it is also saying that 65% uh, of the skills which are currently in demand uh, in the ICT industry are going to be all right. So 35% are going to be different, but 65% are going to be stable. Uh, and then you have some other matrix there as well. So uh, what this particular slide shows is that yes, while there is a there is a big concern, things are not going to change overnight. Things are going to take time, and uh, but it is sure it's a sure and gradual process of change. So if you go to the next slide, uh, which talks about uh, professional services, again, you will see that things are. Uh, are similar there as well. So here also from a workforce disruption perspective, uh, generally the outlook is stable. Our skills are again 67% in terms of the, the stability and what is being used here. And you can see that uh, some of the things which are growing significantly are things around on the, le right, the left-hand side, uh, data analysis, 5.3%, and, and software and application developers as well. So that's the one, that's the job or, or the, the segment which seems to be most threatened. But from a global perspective, and this is, by the way, the last slide and this slide both are global, uh, it seems to be at the moment okay. And the other point which I'd like to mention here is that uh, the impact of these disrupt disruptive technologies is going to be different at different points of time in different countries. So not all countries will get impacted immediately. And that's a very critical thing to understand as well. But now if you go to the next slide, that gives you a little more uh, familiarity or, or insight into what is happening in India. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. And here, uh, I think the point comes through. So if you look at India, and this has UK and US there as well, because these probably three are the, the big, uh, big countries from our interest perspective, because a lot of you will end up working in India or, uh, you know, like to go to UK and US, which are the biggest, uh, uh, you know, importers of our skills. But if you look at India, for example, ICT technology is coming down. And that's the point I was trying to make earlier, that uh, in terms of the kind of jobs which have been happening in India, which have been moving away, those are surely and uh, slowly coming down. And this is going to be a trend which is not going to get reversed. There will be a reduction in number of people which are getting employed, as well as uh, people who get uh, you know, uh, redundant, for example, they may not come back. Uh, to the same level of job and the same scale which they were. So I think that's very important to understand that when we are talking about traditional IT skills, uh, which is what India has been known for, you know, basically we had thousands and millions of, you know, lakhs of employees coming out of these colleges, and then they were deployed as an army 
uh, in the client location. That bit is not going to happen anymore. So that's going to come down significantly as we go ahead. On the other hand, the professional services are, are still showing a good uh, increase in India. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, what's the workforce of the future from an Accenture perspective? Accenture, as you know, has uh, has rotated to the new much faster than any of our competition. If you have been following in terms of what has been the the, the performance of Accenture versus some of the Indian IT companies, most of them are struggling. The reason why Accenture has been able to maintain its uh, both mind share and market share in digital is because we have rotated to the new much faster than them. And when we talk about rotating to the new, uh, in almost, for example, 50% of Accenture's almost $35 billion revenue today comes from digital services. And a key component of that has been how we have been able to reskill and uh, you know acquire new digital capabilities and skills as we have gone ahead. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side uh, chart, it talks about uh, on the vertical axis you see task-based work and on the on the horizontal pure open marketplaces. So we, we started off with six role, core team kind of a thing, and now we are into what we call high commitment liquid workforce, which means that uh, you know critical skills which are existing today uh, in, in Accenture can be deployed uh, in a very easy manner in any account or in any area where they are uh, where they are required. So it's a very liquid workforce. That's the name which Accenture gives. Uh, as we go ahead, you're going to look into new models coming up. For example, internal on-demand talent pool, uh, external talent network. You know, you will have a lot of people who will be just contractors or, or just working with Accenture. May not be permanent employees. And then finally, you have a full public crowd freelance worker kind of a marketplace. So. What this trajectory shows you is that uh, what we used to have earlier, where we had most, perm you know, most of all permanent employees and they were working for years, is going to change through different models. And Accenture is already taking its journey through these different steps, which I just described to you. Okay. And finally, I think it's probably my last slide, uh, and I think this gives good. Uh, uh, good leeway to what uh, Dr. Shivam is going to be talking about. But this is a, an interesting slide uh, which you should Google in terms of if you look at 160 jobs of the future, Thomas Ray, you will get it. And what uh, the team has done here is to actually filter some of those out which are going to be very important for the audience on this call. And we thought it would be nice to tell you what, what some of these big skills are as we go ahead in terms of demand. So you can see a uh, lot of them in terms of the uh, the IoT and sensors, which we talked about earlier as well, that that's going to be a critical component of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, attached to that is big data. So, you know, you can't really do any analytics if you don't have a good understanding of how you want to manage data and how do you want to uh, use that data to turn that into insights. So Internet of Things and Industry 4.0 we talked about. A lot of things are going to happen in 3D printing, commercial drone industries, and uh, and then what we call extreme innovation. Again, this is a global perspective. Uh, so if, I, if you were to ask me in terms of what that means in India, I think from an India perspective, things especially around uh, anything which is relating to big data and Internet of Things uh, is going to be significantly big uh, along with artificial intelligence. So. If you had to ask me and say, okay, if you want to take a punt, what are the two top skills which you think will be the ones which are going to be riding the wave in India while this slide shows the global one? I will, I will put my money on uh, Internet of Things, Big Data, and Artificial Intelligence. Okay, Tina, is there any other slide? I hope not. All right, so with that, uh, to give you a perspective of, one, why digital disruption is important, and second, uh, how the future of work is going to be different, and what kind of skills will be critical as we need to succeed in the digital uh, digital world. But what you really need to do uh, is what's going to be talked about now. So I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Dr. Shom Datta, who is also the co-chair of NASCOM Product Council, and I'll request Shom to take you from here. Shom, Thank can you? you uh, yeah. Oh, good. And you're you're on here right now? Oh. Yes, uh, Richard, can you hear me? I can, Doctor. And it's Doctor. How do you say your first name? Samduta? Samduta Singh? No, it's it's pr it's pronounced as Shomdatta. Well, I know. It's, it's a tongue twister, so it's easier to... Yeah, so I'm not going to make your life harder, Richard, so let's just call Shom. 
just for everybody. Sure. You know, most people even in India don't get it right, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm glad to have you, and I have you loud and clear, uh, Dr. Shom Singh. Um, and let me go ahead and hand it over to you since we're running about five minutes late, which is fine. We have a little over sure. time if we need it. And welcome sure. aboard. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, thank you, Avnish, for sending uh, for setting such a strong context. I think uh, one of the things I like I would like to take over before I delve deeper into my uh, slides is the fact that most people have been worrying, or rather, worrying to death about saying that hey, automation is going to kill jobs. I don't think so. Well, what we really need to understand is the purpose of rev uh, the purpose of industrial revolution for mankind has always been to find ways to get rid of what is mundane, which means automate what is mundane, so that you have more time to create and deliver on new things. What digital really means is a binary of zero and one, and what that binary means is an input ratio which is predominantly robust enough to deliver a better output so that you have more time to deliberate and create new things. If these things were not possible, or rather if automation was not taking its lead, we would have still been stuck in the days of Python and not been working on technologies like Ruby, and Ruby on Rails, or talking about Internet of Things, and talking about machines being able to learn and adopt. So we need to, we need to always be aware that the fine line between being talented and being relevant is skills. And while our education system, specifically in India, is grappling or rather working towards, uh, you know, uh, creating new curriculums, enabling a new, you know, front of education, it is institutions like Simply Learn who are also bringing forth to you the opportunity to adapt yourself to new learning techniques. So I don't think it, it should be an either or, like saying, hey, is, there, is the mandate of an educational institution or a mandate of a corporate to equip me with skills that are relevant or make me relevant, but it should be about leveraging the tools and technologies that are available to you to upgrade yourself so you're relevant. So that's exactly what digital means. Digital means the ability to adapt into technologies which will enable you to better communicate externally with your customers, with government, with friends, with families, all of that together, right? So it's, it's a cumulative method, so we should not ever look at it in isolation. That is one. The second thing is, often we confuse digital and try to feel, or rather try to conceptualize and think, hey, it's synonymous to only web or social. It's not. Currently, it's a summation of web, social, and mobile, which means any tool that is available to you today to further your communication to your endpoint that can start with something as basic as your website that can go into your website, link to your social channels. That can be channels beyond just Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, but uh, or spill over to uh, you know uh, spill over to tools like Quora, like Instagram, uh, like hashtags, like using autocrit for content and so on. And it can mean the mobile because of course with the penetration of the smartphone usage specifically in India, and we need to keep in mind, guys. I'm going to talk from an India context, and I'm going to tell you why. Because this country is the biggest serviceable country right now. Even though the smartphone penetration has been growing 25 to 30% year on year, today smartphones are getting consumed, or rather smartphones are deliberately getting consumed mostly by the urban population. So the penetration in the rural segment is still picking up. Most of the people in the rural segment use their smartphones only to consume video content or for the purpose of messaging alone. So they're still not penetrated into using it for knowledge, for education, for transaction. So as it starts building in, think about the opportunity that lies in front of us, which is humongous. So mobility is going to change the way conversations happen, communication happens, transaction happens, and that's the next big thing, and even why government is heavily investing in it. So when we talk about this connection point, what does it really mean? So there are different plays here, right? Before, we used to only talk about business to business and business to consumer, but now it's government to voter, right? Where government is leveraging tools and technologies to reach out to voters and consumers for better, better interaction. We talk about, you know, voters to the government, where they are providing input for running the, uh, for running the country in a better format, or even talking about how they can engage and provide tools and technologies. As, you, as most of you know, Beam came out of a young, you know, was a product of a young mind who was a part of the Atal Innovation Lab, and it was not really a big company that went into creating it. 
So even the smallest opportunities can have a very big play if done right at the right time. And then you have consumers to government and you have the business to government connection points. So you can pretty much leverage the tools that is available to you from web social mobile to make any of these point connections possible. And that is very, very important. Now, well, some of you have asked me what G2V, V2G means, and trust me, it's not a silly question, and I think it's Rama who you asked me. I think it's a very, very strong question, because as we are evolving in the digital era, our communication points have changed beyond just business to consumer and, and consumer to, uh, you know, and, and business to business or business to consumer. So now it's government to voters, voter to government, government to consumers, and many more. Uh, can I move on to this next slide, please? Well, guys, I'm continuously watching at the chat uh, panel. So if you have any questions, keep coming them in. I'm going to try and address them as I go through my slides because that's how the interaction is going to kind of build in. Now let's talk about the skill gap. Now what do I mean by skill gap? Um, you know, Avnish was correctly articulating that our education system at large has not really equipped our pupils with the tools and technologies that makes them relevant for a job for a longer period of time. Now, the tools and techniques is not just theoretical in nature, it's also practical. So today, if you go to go and see an engineering syllabus, it's still talking about Python and COBOL and basic C++. Well, we've moved away from that, and we are talking about even things like Granium. So we, but as, as we know that, you know, in a systematic fashion, when an education system of a country has to get overhauled, it's not going to be an overnight thing. So keep your ears and eyes open for courses that are available on online platforms like Simply Learn, like ours, where you can actually kind of pick up the skills that is necessary, constantly keep yourself abreast of the new tools and technologies that is coming in. And let me tell you, the other synonym of digital is evolution, which means it's changing every six months to one year. That's how rapid it is. So you need to keep yourself up with it. So the skills that currently in an Indian mandate is that 90% of the marketeers lack digital skills. And what I mean by that is today people who are wearing the hat of a marketeer or a digital marketer in an organization may not even be certified. And why is it so important to be certified? Certification doesn't just mean acquisition of a set of you know, skills and techniques, but it means being relevant and being aware of the methodologies that are getting introduced, which can ensure that you have a better delivery model within your organization. So you bring in that protein to your organization, which enables you to show better KRA and better growth. So you identify channels to reach consumers and businesses at the lowest possible cost and at the fastest possible time. And that's where the skill gap is today. So most of the people don't know how to use it. 600 million internet users in India are being reached with digital communication, but they are not serviceable yet. So there are many uh, programs that the government is introducing, that the cartels are introducing to make that channel possible. But what I would talk about is those people who are listening today is that if you really have to disrupt and find new ways of reaching them, you have to do it by adapting new technologies and learning about them and figuring what is your best possible communication route to your customer. In some cases, it may mean you're spending more money on mobile and not necessarily investing so much on your web to reach out to your customers because they, they make decisions based on your, uh, you know, based on communication they receive on mobile. Examples, real estate, e-commerce, so on. Now, in terms of the digital marketing jobs, so when we talk about skills and when we talk about <coughs> automation, you also need to understand with every new technology that has been introduced in the last 10 years, it has created new jobs. Automation is only of that that existed before, but new introduction of technologies need, need new people with the skills, so jobs are not going to get lost. <coughs> it just means we're just going to have new jobs on new job titles. Big data was not known about 15 years back, and now you have 10 different job titles just under big data. Cybersecurity was just about antivirus. Now, cybersecurity domain has 160 different subdomains. It just means there is more nuances to the existing old skills, but it does not mean replacement of all. So digital marketing alone will have about 1.5 lakh jobs that it will create in 2017. So just go on and look into your LinkedIn. Don't just send connection requests. Try and leverage building and see what the job status looks like. You will be surprised, pleasantly surprised to see that the number of jobs that are increasing digital is growing at a 15 to 20 percent month on month. So it's not just six months to a year, it's just month on month. And with the new tech and VR and AI, it's just making the possibility of connection seamless. 
And that's a great domain, that's a great area where most of the companies are going to invest in, which means they're going to hire new people to work on those areas because machine will not create algorithms, humans will. So that stays constant. So go ahead and kind of equip yourself with those. Can we move to the next slide, please? Now, digital skills. Um, if we talk about how do we go ahead and formulate ourselves, um, one of the breakthrough, or rather one of the disruption that I see possible in India, which is going to change the game, is we do not just educate and make people literate on digital using English as a medium of language. It has to become beyond that. We have to understand that there are almost 11 official languages we have in India, and if we really have to penetrate into the rural segment where still people are graduating from government schools and colleges, learning uh, the basics in Marathi, Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, we need to ensure that we are creating programs that are catering in these languages. And why it's so essential is because local language marketing is the next big thing. Think of China, think of Spain, think of Japan. It is the local language that ultimately goes into penetrating into the larger audience. So it's extremely important to create curriculums and programs and equip ourselves on campaigns that are more language focused. And that will also enhance our ability to penetrate deeper into the audience that we're looking to harness and harness our skills. So even those who are learning in English, I'm going to suggest please learn how to do local language marketing because that's the next big thing and Google is going to be investing heavily in it, so is Facebook. So it's going to be good to kind of equip yourself in those things. And even today, people, when they are building algorithms in the area of even artificial intelligence, they are using local language as one of the parameters. So it's very, very important to learn and know about it. Um, move, next slide, please. So in terms of, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time, and I believe that, you know, uh, it's it institutes like Simply Learn and us who, who, who do things which is, which is in parallel, but it's more complementary in nature. Uh, is that we work at a university level where we believe that the only way to make India self-sustainable or rather an economy that is growing at an 8% year on year is not by looking for new jobs, is by becoming more self-reliant. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to start your own business. It means you need to create, create more trainers. So we have been constantly working with the, you know, the government institutions, the universities, in training more people who in turn, at the comfort of their home, so for example, somebody's getting trained in Raipur, in Aurangabad, in, uh, in, uh, in Kolkata, or even in Belur, even in uh, you know, Jharkhand, are becoming trainers who are then going ahead and training people on digital uh, skills and technologies. Some of them are doing this training using local language. And why it's so important is that either you get a job, if you do not get a job, you're going to use your hours by training more people. And through platforms like Simply Learn, where thousands of students are constantly looking and evaluating courses, it's very important to find the right talent to teach them. So we want to bridge that gap. We want to make people more self-reliant. And that's where our goal comes in. And we say, hey, you know what? Digital literacy is not going to be about just introducing digital technologies. It's going to be about training people to train more people on these technologies so that the market for the consumption of whether it's retail, whether it's real estate, whether it's, whether it's other consumer products, just increases multifold. And customers are going to do that by using mobile, using web, using socialized channels, which is not possible today. Even now, the most of the user base where e-commerce companies or real estate see transactions online is only the urban population, and that has to change. So we're trying to bridge that gap by training more and more people in the rural segment to do that. And next slide, please. Now, top skills required today. When I talk about the top skills required today, guys, you need to, you need to keep in mind that keep your eyes and ears open to look out of, for platforms that offer you this curriculum. Um, I, was, I often get called on uh, different shows to talk about, hey, is the Indian layoff scene real? Are people really losing jobs? What's going to happen to people who've been in the company for 20 years? Well, it's not really the company's responsibility alone to train you. If you are looking, remember something, not to, it's not just the company laying people off. People are transitioning from jobs, they're leaving jobs too because they want a better opportunity. Some people are leaving to start up their own company and some are doing to become uh, more self-reliant. So if you, if you look at where you need, where your mandate comes in, like you pick up, pick up a book to read because you want to acquire knowledge, 
go to a go to an online platform, sign up for a course, and get yourself equipped with it. And most platforms today have phenomenal curriculum that they've developed on areas like analytics and big data, SEO and digital content, digital design. And what digital design is, it's very very important that you know you to understand that UX UI and and uh, user interface content plays a very very important role in customer engagement. Ad tech, as you mostly know, you know, ads whether you're running on social, on mobile, or on web, the, te the technologies are constantly evolving. Google releases a new technology method every six months. So if you're not abreast with it, it becomes very difficult for you to stay relevant. Social media marketing, well, there are new channels coming up every day. What is largely social is understood in India. If you are a company that is servicing a user outside of India, let's say in an Australia or in a UK or in a US, it's not going to be a it's not going to be a Facebook or it's going to be mostly a Friendster or some other tools that is going to get you the uh, right kind of mind share. So you have to keep keep uh, yourself aware of those tools and technology and app development. That is going to stay relevant no matter what kind of tools and technologies come into play. App development will become a very very important part. And when I say app development, it is one of the critical point of communication, which not only simplifies user engagement but also helps in managing user data and improvising, improvises machine learning to a very, very large extent. Even it's going to be the mother of all IoT innovation. So it's very, very important to know that. Now, um, when, you, when we talk about skills, some, of, some things we need to understand is that if you're already certified, let's say, a Linux certified professional, or let's say, uh, you know, big data certified professional, you need to Keep in mind that there are a lot of new technologies that are coming in big data as such, or in in app development as such. You need to go and keep yourself reskilled, keep yourself recertified, because that's one. Of, that's not only about the company seeing your potential. That's also about you being able to realize what what, what you want to do in future. And I see more and more people in India uh, going back to our olden days. By the way, India used to be a very business centric country until you know thousands of years of innovation. I think we're going back there, right? It can be individual businesses, it can be startups, it can be SMEs, it can be enterprises. And I know there are a lot of people who are building technologies which are just getting adopted by the enterprises straight away. So that's very critical for us to understand. So automation is not going to eat up jobs. Automation is just going to make things that are mundane more automated so that you have more time to actually learn and leverage new things. But remember something, digital, the world of digital is constantly evolving and changing. And like Avnish said, it's not now restricted to uh, you know, one form of uh, platform. It's physical and biological, which is very, very important for us to understand. So you know, keep yourself open. Keep, keep yourself abreast with what's coming new. And keep learning. And thank you so much. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions if you have. But that's all for me today. Mm. Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful. Boy, I, just oh, keeping up yeah. with you is um, uh, a challenge for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we have a lot Thank of questions. You, have... I just wanted to. I just wanted to summarize. Can you can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so this is Avnish and uh, you know, thank you, Dr. Shom, for this uh, great uh, you know, presentation. I think that was very, very relevant. I just want to summarize this for all of you by saying a few things which you can take uh, from this uh, session as a, as a key insight and a key takeaway. One is that disruption, digital disruption, is happening and it is real, right? And, and there is no doubt about that. You have seen that. And, you know, industries, governments, countries, uh, everybody is being disrupted. The second thing is that... Uh, you know, you need to basically the key skill which you need to take is that yes, you will have many degrees and all, but what you can what you can teach yourself is how to be a lifelong learner. That is a core skill which you need to take. And what the Dr. Shom was saying, and you know what, uh, where you know platforms like Simply Learn become very important is that going ahead when you are a lifelong learner, that doesn't mean you're going to have long degrees and long courses. It will be just in time, just enough kind of education. And these kind of platforms, as what you see in Simply Learn, are going to be very, very critical uh, to get that just-in-time, just-enough learning. The last point, uh, because that should not be missed, is that as, as machines take a lot of these jobs, and uh, especially from an analytical perspective, uh, 
one thing which will be critical and you need to be building all this because i i find it even in accenture that you know when i find some of the technical people i work with they seem to be lacking it uh, is soft skills so the ability to for example able to empathize collaborate work in teams set goals and lead people these things can never be automated so a lot of uh, soft skills a lot of things which require human touch creativity please make sure that you are paying enough emphasis to these soft skills as well as you constantly upgrade on your hard skills so a combination of that would be, would be something which will make you successful going forward so with this i'll stop and uh, if there are questions for either dr shom or me happy to take them uh, well how about we start i have a question uh, for both of you that's come up a lot and we see that uh, pretty much worldwide is security um, that's a big catch issue right now as we automate everything we definitely don't want uh, people to go in and hack them can you speak as far as uh, very specific to um, cyber security and what kind of jobs are right now where do you see that going uh so uh, dr shom you want to take that because you were referring to cyber security you would you like to take that on of course i think uh, you know security at large has always been something uh through all these industrial revolution people have focused on so you know whether it's been the heavy machine industry where it's going to be you know typically the physical part of the people getting affected where people had to take precautions today it's cyber security because information at large is available on the net and that makes everybody extremely vulnerable so what i what i want to emphasize is that while all the other technologies whether it's big data whether it's iot whether it's machine learning ar vr is going to be on a part of advent it is not going to be in isolation with you know in isolation to cyber security with information information security will become the most predominant active, act, act, aspect and what would it include it would include big data which means there's going to be constant churning of looking at data and intelligence and understanding user behavior which will be then coupled with predictive analytics which means it will start determining what is vulnerable and what may be vulnerable because you know there is no concept of nothing is you know something is not vulnerable so what may be vulnerable now to what may become vulnerable in future and therefore technologies are going to be adopted and implemented at layer 1 layer 2 depending on the level of vulnerability the third important aspect which is going to which is going to be very important for information security is that it will start adopting the machine will start adopting and understanding based on predictive analytics what the user may end up doing and therefore start it deploying the levels of security at that that stage itself and finally to sum it all uh, there is going to be you know like we said you can never take away the human interface because at the end of the day there is no replacement for the human intellect that's why it's called as artificial intelligence so the real intelligence is going to be is going to be playing a very very critical role in looking at uh, you know deep learning uh, technologies that is going to actually so up information to quickly submit and act on it more on an overlay approach so information security is it works both at an operating system level to a middleware level to at a cloud level which is a combination of big data predictive analytics machine learning and deployment of finally security method algorithms so that's pretty much where it lies so i would say that it's it's one of the biggest areas where people are investing in and uh, recently abhish and i were in israel which is all about you know cyber security and abhish can throw more light but i would just say this it was a problem before it stays as a problem but the solution is equipping ourselves with the tools and technologies that will help us uh, you know play an important role in that vertical yeah and just to add to what dr shom said so if you look at cyber security as a profession you know that would need for example specialization either in web application security network security Uh, malware understanding or even other various uh, issues like for example iot security now if it is not secure it is useless that is the motto which uh, i think is very clear that if it is not secure it is useless applies very very critically in internet of things which is the core component of fourth industrial revolution but you can see the direct correlation that if internet of things has to boost or turbocharge the industrial revolution it has to be secure because if uh, if people think that you know these sensors and different actuators are going to get hacked then nobody is going to be scaling internet of things going forward so uh, spada systems for example all these will be very critical and in terms of some of the the key skills 
You can talk about, uh, you know, secure coding, cyber forensics. All these will be critical, very critical, as Dr. Shom talked about, because for all these technologies to succeed, it is important that people have uh, confidence that uh, the data will be secure. And one of the big things which we are talking about today is you know, the, the protection of your identity as well, which is directly related to data and cyber security. So that is what, what we would like to talk about here. It's a very, very significant opportunity for professionals, and it's going to just increase, as, as you can see with all the, all the issues which are going around security and management of identity. Mm. Mm. Excellent. Uh, it, yeah, what a world we live in. This is exciting. Um, we have a, a lot of questions coming in from people, um, and I'm going to try to summarize like about a dozen different questions in one. And just for everybody's information, if you uh, both are willing, since we started late, we can go an extra five to ten minutes, if that's okay? Yeah, we can do another five minutes. Okay, excellent. Um, one of the questions a lot of people ask um, is, Reskilling. Um, I know that comes up a lot where somebody is either just starting into the workforce and they go out and get their first certificate um, or they've been in sales for eight years and now they want to get go into uh, uh, digital, uh, the digital marketing. What would be your suggestion to someone who's trying to figure out which direction to go in first and where to go and get the experience and the job. I mean, you know, that's what it's about. Not necessarily a job, but uh, earn some income at it. What would be your suggestion to people like that who are trying to switch their careers or just starting out? Uh, Sean, you would you like to take that? Well, sure. Um, you know, so digital is, is a very, very broad area like, like I talked about. Now, especially when you're in functions like sales and marketing, I think what really is your KRA or what really mandates in, you in an organization is how quickly you can acquire more customers and how you can basically reduce the cost of that acquisition. These are two critical metrics based on which they are evaluated. Now, when you're looking at that, then what really matters is to, is to quickly abreast yourself with tools and technologies that helps you get there. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind, or rather always is something that I always uh, you know, tell the students to go for, is get a Google uh, fundamental certification. It's very, very important. And why I say that is that like, Google has 90% of the web. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about how China and everything else has the rest, but that's, 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 your, pet, that's your mother of all uh, you know, reach. So you have to understand how the tools and technologies that are there, it literally works. And that can mean that you understand how ads work, you start with understanding how SEO works uh, and go into ads so you know that whether you want to use a uh, you know, cost per click, a cost per conversion, or a cost per impression kind of a metric to reach out to your customer, depending on the industry that you're in. Then it comes to the fact where you are understanding the analytics. Because, see, without the knowledge or without being able to correlate the input and output that I talked about, which is the apparent parameters of digital, it's very difficult for you to devise campaigns. Gone are the days when people would do, uh, you know, people would do experimental campaigns where they would just go put something, try and see. Now they want to do logical, interest-based, demography-based, target-based campaigns. And that's possible only when you know the tools, especially when you know analytics. And I see the beauty with today's all these curriculum is that even if you're not a technology expert, even if you are not an engineer by profession, you can pick up these things very, very easily because they're so well streamlined and there's so many deep, uh, you know, deep learning education formats that are available today become very easy. So I think that's the first way to go. The second way would be Facebook has just launched its certification program. Uh, again, a very, very uh, deep learning program, but I think it's going to be huge for most of the people who are learning because stop using Facebook just to like posts and share, start using it to make business. And that's what I believe. Individuals are leveraging it, so companies should leverage it as well. I know bloggers who earn anywhere, anywhere between a lakh to about two lakhs a month by just using, uh, leveraging Facebook as a digital uh, you know, campaign uh, platform. So it's very important to rest yourself with those tools and technologies. Beyond that, there are many more. Uh, there are many more which are regional focused, which means depends on the geography. Uh, there, there are a lot of other tools, but the certifications, these two are uh, very, very important. But there are today a lot of institutes who are creating their own curriculum and providing, so you can go ahead and take a look at that. I think Rashmi was asking this question online. I was just about to revert to her. Is it worth it? Of course it's worth it. 
And sales is a function of marketing. So if you can't define customers, if you don't know what their interests are, if, they don't, if you don't know how they react, you can't create campaigns. So it's very much worth it to give it a shot. And I'll just add one more thing here in terms of the skills, so uh, digital marketing and uh, you know customer acquisition, obviously very critical. But if you look at digital transformation which organizations are going through and you know, the skill which a company like Exchange is looking at, so uh, there are two parts of it. One is the internal part which we call digital enterprise, and this is where you use digital technologies like artificial intelligence or IoT to improve the productivity of an organization, right? So. Many, many such technologies, including robotics and cognitive, are being used to improve the, the internal processes and productivity of organizations. So those become very critical. And as, uh, as Dr. Shom was saying, on the other hand is what we call digital customer. That means uh, improving the customer experience. I think customer experience design is probably one of the critical skills uh, which is emerging uh, on the front end of the digital transformation. So anything in terms of how do you define the persona, how do you define the journey of uh, of a customer, and how do you basically delight the customer and improve the customer experience, all those skills, which some of them, uh, which uh, Vishwam was talking about, are going to be very critical. So these two, one on the back end side in terms of using hard technology like deep learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, cognitive, uh, you know, uh, these will be very important on the back end side. And as you go ahead on the front end side, it is all about uh, digital marketing, uh, content marketing, uh, performance marketing, um, you know, customer experience design. Those will be critical. And another question I think which is which is coming up is that well, we have a certification, uh, but we don't have experience. So is there hope for people like us as well? Uh, absolutely, there is. So uh, you know, in terms of uh, today's world and where, for example, the way or the approach Accenture takes is not looking at uh, you know whether you have many years of experience because when we are talking about technologies like blockchain or artificial intelligence or robotics these technologies are pretty new so i can't be asking you that please come with five years of ex experience in blockchain technology well that that will make me look foolish right so that's not going to happen if you have uh, certified and if you have skills which you can demonstrate so you know again when accenture is hiring now we are not looking for your your cv or you know we will for example do an hackathon Right? And in the hackathon, we will test out exactly what kind of skills you have. And it doesn't really matter if you have any experience or zero experience, it doesn't matter. If you can demonstrate that you have mastered or you have a pretty good idea about this particular technology, you will be hired. Accenture is not a fool to think that we need years of experience in these technologies. That's just not going to happen and we will not ask you to do that. You have to demonstrate those skills on the ground in a place like hackathon, for example. Mm, nice. And just a, a quick follow-up on um, the Accenture. You guys are mainly based out of India, but are you also international then too? <laughs> that is a very interesting question. I've never been asked that. So we are in uh, we are in 150 odd countries. Uh, India is uh, yes our biggest geography. Uh, we have about uh, more than 150,000 to 170,000 people just in India, and the reason for that is that we have big uh, global delivery capabilities, both from a technology and, and BPO perspective. So we hire a significant amount of people in India, uh, almost 50,000 people every year. And if you look at, uh, again, uh, you know, in terms of what has been happening from a hiring perspective, Accenture is probably the only company, uh, whether it is from an MNT perspective or Indian pure plays, Accenture is the only company which has not talked about, uh, you know, retrenchment or firing or anything like that. We are constantly looking into hire new people, but yes, definitely uh, in skills which are aligned to Accenture's agenda. So uh, yes, Accenture is completely international company. We are so international that we don't even have a headquarter. Our our chairman, uh, our CEO is a French. Our chief operating officer is a Belgian. Our, uh, you know, uh, the head of technology is an Indian, so you never know what kind of company Accenture is, but it is certainly an international company. <laughs> Excellent. I, I really think that um, one of our biggest changes we've seen is how most companies are now international, um, which I love. I love seeing the innovation across the world and the think tanks and the incubators and startups. Um, we do have, uh, for those who, if we don't get to your questions, uh, they will be going through, we'll have somebody going through and sending out emails and answering what questions we can. Uh, you can also 
go to our website and request a copy of the recording. Uh, if you just go under any of the support tabs, Simply Learn will then send you uh, to your email a link, then you can download the copy of the recording and uh, view it for later. We'll go ahead and go ahead and close it up. Do you, uh, if you guys have anything else you would like to add before we close this session uh, for both uh, Dr. Uh, Sum Singh and yourself, uh, go ahead. We can go ahead and do that, and then we'll go ahead and close the session for today. Yeah, I think uh, you know I have from my side uh, talked about it, and you know again just to summarize, if you look at the chessboard, we are in the second half of the chessboard. What it means is that uh, every 18 months the change is going to double. Right. And what that means is that because of that change happening so fast and uh, a combination of technologies leading to that, there will be many jobs which existed in the future which won't exist uh, as we go ahead, but there will be many new jobs which did not exist in the, in the past which will start existing. Right. So that's what it is, and uh, the whole concept of being a lifelong learner, uh, combining hard skills and soft skills, and just in time, just enough, is what's going to make you succeed. Ashom? Well, thank you, Avnish. Uh, first, I want to thank the entire Simply Learn team, um, Avnish, Tina, uh, you know, for making this session possible. I think we had tremendously active participants, uh, you know, who had some really great questions come in. I couldn't answer. I tried my best to answer most of them. Couldn't answer all of them, but happy to take them offline. Uh, all I'm going to say is this: uh, You've come today to share this session to basically try and understand what you can learn and take away and what should your next steps be. So here is, here is my you know, three things that you should be doing after this. One, identify an area that you're really passionate about and you're looking to learn for a while and haven't found time. Go research on it and quickly enroll yourself. And I, why I say this is because knowledge can be acquired through three mediums. One, you read a book. Two, you hear people who have experienced it. Three, get experience it yourself. So go ahead and do that because you can keep listening to people unless and until you experience it, the knowledge yourself, you'll really not know the impact it's going to have, have on your life. The second thing that I'm going to talk about, if you're not happy doing what you're doing, go ahead and take a look at the new things that are available and see if you already have the skills mapping to it and try and go and give it a shot. Because I think the only way we're going to keep evolving is by a distributed learning and job mechanism. That's very, very important. The third thing, uh, if you've had enough of jobs, not looking to necessarily start up, but remember something, teaching is a profession that is very, very coveted. And if you can learn the tools and technologies yourself, you can empower more and more people to become more self-reliant, to get not affected by this entire storm of automation, and harbor new talent and create a better ecosystem in this country and abroad. So I believe one of the things that I've always said that, the net, you know, if, it's, if you say that need is the mother of invention, Focus on something leads to better uh, initiation. So go ahead, try something new, get yourself equipped, and empower more people. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this session and hope to talk to you guys soon. Thank you, and what a what a wonderful session. Um, I just I actually love my job being in the background and listening to these. <laughs> I very much appreciate your time with us today, and we look forward to um, hopefully having you on again at some point. Uh, wonderful session and webinar. Again, everybody, if you uh, want a copy of recording or if you um, have additional questions, you can come to Simply Learn. They will try to answer the questions that were missed in the chat because they do go through that and send out notes. Um, but you're also welcome to come and check in with the support. If you go under support and send them a note, uh, they'll send you out a copy of this recording so you can go back and review it. And uh, there's also people you can chat with there if you have more questions on the different certificates that are available now at Simply Learn too. Uh, we don't hand out Thank personal you. emails. Uh, I know someone's asking that question. With that, we'll go ahead and close the session. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here, and I wish everybody happy learning and good luck with whatever professions and careers you choose in or whatever forward movement in your current professions you go with. Thank you, Richard. Really enjoyed it. Have a good one. You too. <laughs> Take care.